My name is Julie Pearson Little Thunder. Today is Tuesday, April 28, 2014, and I'm interviewing Phyllis Fife, both of whose sisters are well-known Muskogee Creek artists. Phyllis, you're director of the Center for Tribal Studies at Northeastern State University, where you've also taught art and art history, directed the bilingual education program, and each year you coordinate an SU Symposium of the American Indian. But you are also a painter and clothing designer for Fife Collection Limited, which was one of the early Oklahoma Native clothing lines to really break through to a national market. Thank you for agreeing to talk with me today. Thank you. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Oak Vesky County, Oklahoma, in the Creek Nation. And uh, we lived just a few miles north of the town of Dustin, Oklahoma, but in the old uh, Thiwathli tribal town community. And um, the Creek Church that we have always attended, that our family helped found, is the Thiwathli Indian Baptist Church, which is just about a mile from our house. So uh, that is the community that I know as, as my home. Um, I know from talking with your sisters that your father worked for Stanlin Oil Company and your mother was a teacher. Starting with your father, how did he influence or encourage the creative environment in your home? Our father was very inventive and um, he was very resourceful. Um, he probably taught us the value of saving uh, any kind of materials that we might turn into some type of creativity, uh, something for use later. And um, he also uh, showed his artistic talent from time to time. He didn't, uh, he didn't purposely, I guess, uh, deliberately um, try to show us his artistic side but we saw it uh, come out anyway. He was, when he did anything, whatever, whatever he created, whatever he built, uh, he would always do it with very um, careful, carefully rendered skills. He, if he um, built something from wood, he tried to make it look as finished as possible and um, if he, whatever he did, even you know welding a gate, he didn't like sloppy work and he didn't like for us to do sloppy work. How about your mother? Our mother was, she was very creative and we knew uh, from a very early age about her, um, her schooling and her her education, starting from <clears throat> living in the rural community just north of where we were raised. We were raised at the home place where our father had been born and raised. And our mother had been born across the river from him just about three or four miles, although they didn't know each other as, as young people. Um, she lived with, uh, they both were from large families and also surrounded by lots of cousins and aunts and uncles. So this type of environment is uh, one that probably stimulates more creativity and, and uh, just if you have any kind of artistic talents, then they're gonna come out some way because um, we knew that our mother had gone to away to school both our parents had gone to boarding schools. And um, so home and living in that rural community where we, we had a creek in front of our house, a creek behind our house. And so on a day like today when it was uh, going to rain, we knew it was going to rain, then we knew that when the rain was over and the rain soaked into the ground that there was going to be clay on the creek banks. And so our mother just uh, really let us have the freedom and uh, encouraged us to try our hand at building things with clay. Uh, we tried 
our hand at whittling out of wood. We <laughs> made things out of mud. I mean, uh, we tried our hand at sewing and cutting things, making things out of paper. So uh, probably we had the ideal situation there with, uh, with our mother and, and some of our aunts also, our uncles, relatives. And you also did some early bead work. I did, and I brought a piece to show you. Um, when we were very young, our mother taught us to do beadwork, and I can't remember a time when we didn't have a lot of beads around the house. I mean, and of course, many of them were all mixed up to where if you wanted to make a pattern, you had to pick through the beads to find the colors, <laughs> find enough of the colors. But um, our father used to also uh, bring us things to make artwork with when he could. And so he brought us home, brought home beads too from, from Tulsa where he worked. And uh, when I was in the, about the fourth grade, I would say maybe nine years old, uh, my mother taught me how to bead on a loom. And uh, so this is what I made. And I worked to school really often. I made two necklaces actually. Uh, the other one was a different style that was more in tune with what it was supposed to turn out like. But this was an early experiment. <laughs> and a finished product is, for me, that is a success if I ever have a finished product. So um, it was just something that I've kept over the years. What is your first um, memory of seeing a piece of Native art? Probably when I uh, was born, I was born in the house that I was raised in. I was born at home, and on the walls we had art. And the earliest piece that made a big impression on me, although we had some really fine pieces of art by one of the Kiowa Five artists, actually, who was a friend of my mother when she went to school at OU. Um, the art that impressed me the most, the earliest that I can recall, was a mural that my sister Carol had drawn with colored chalk on our old faded wallpaper. The wallpaper, I think they said it used to be a pale pink, but now when I was born it was kind of a rich brown looking color. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and a very good paper for drawing with chalk. I'm very porous, and uh, so, like I said, our father made us bead looms. He provided artwork, art supplies, I mean, for us, but he, I'm sure, supplied that colored chalk for her. <laughs> Brilliant colors, too. And she had painted a whole mural on the wall, and my mother said that uh, she woke up one day and there it was on the wall. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was a scene of a village, like a, 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 an encampment with, with uh, people, you know, doing various things in the village. And of course, the fire with the black pot, black kettle, uh, on the fire and stacks of wood and and people carrying water and kids running around. <laughs> I don't remember. It was not preserved unfortunately and, and I'm not sure a photo was ever taken of it either but that is the earliest fine art <laughs> by a famous artist <laughs> that I can remember. That's great. What is your first memory of making art? Well, um, I'm not sure what it was. Um, we always had fabric, scraps of fabric, because my mother sewed and uh, she had many, I remember we had boxes not just a little bit of scraps of fabric, but we had boxes of fabric that were just stored, you know, for, for use. And she would let us dig through the boxes of scraps and get fabric out and try to make doll clothes and 
we uh, tried all kinds of things. I mean, like the whole the whole group of us. We were into collaborative art a lot too. There were uh, eight siblings, uh, eventually, and uh, but I remember uh, that we would try to make. Probably the first thing that I actually tried to make was a little doll quilt, uh, like a nine patch or four patch or something like that and uh, sewing squares together and uh, other than that um, my beadwork when I was nine which that was a big accomplishment when I was about ten I was uh, at school my teachers knew that I could draw and do artwork along with my cousin Anita and so we were called upon if any artwork needed to be done for anything uh, in our school at the time. And uh, I remember that I uh, just reproduced um, etchings that were in our textbooks of portraits. And um, we got to do, they provided us with paint and, and uh, poster board and we got to make a, a replica of the Great Seal of the United States, which we thought was wonderful. <laughs> In my mind, it still was perfect. I'm not sure what it really looked like. Uh, but those are just some of the early things. Probably uh, paper dolls. We, we used to have uh, like Sears and Montgomery Ward catalogs and we were skillful enough to make paper dolls out of the models in these <laughs> in these magazines in the in the catalogs and and cut out clothing and make it fit. So that was adaptive art. So um, other than that, we you know made things out of clay. Like I said, nothing that was um, permanent. So how early did you think of yourself as an artist? Well, the word artist, I think, is way probably above me. Uh, I didn't, didn't think of myself as an artist at all. And uh, there were, within my family, even of siblings, there were various le skill levels of uh, the, the uh, level of execution of what we would maybe call art. Um, so I always had, um, I always aspired to be better at uh, my skills and using tools and materials that were at hand. And um, probably if I, I did at some point put on my resume, professional artist, uh, when I was 16 years old at the Institute of American Indian Arts, um, I was privileged to be uh, selected to be in some art exhibits and, and as I began to uh, sell artwork after I graduated from high school there, um, eventually I used that title, professional artist. How old were you when you went to the Institute? When I went there I was, uh, had just turned 15 years old and uh, when I left I was at the end of my 17th year. I, I went to school there for three years. Um, I guess I was on the verge of being 18, you know, when I left. What kinds of classes did you take? I, we had majors and minors, and I majored in painting, and I minored in exhibition arts, which was museum exhibition uh, work. Did you do any fabric design one you I did, um, because Dr. Lloyd knew, um, who was a fabric designer, recognized that uh, I designed clothing. I mean, <clears throat> we had to make all of our own clothes. I, I don't know at what, I don't, I don't recall exactly when I first ever bought clothing, 
because we, uh, at a very early age, started making, we learned how to sew when we were very young. And so I remember in the seventh grade designing some of my own things, uh, some of my own clothing. And um, <clears throat> so I was, I was pretty skilled at, at doing that. And Dr. Uh, Mr. New recognized that I had that skill and he um, got me involved in some fabric design and I wasn't, uh, I didn't major in that area of design and I didn't ever get real good at, at silk screening fabric. I watched the process and uh, he tried to teach me batik mm -hmm. and I didn't understand what the process was going to be in the end and I, you know, just, I was hit and miss at it, no good. But uh, what he did though was uh, with the fabric the original designed fabric that was produced there, he gave me uh, access to the fabric to design some clothing. So I did that and... Now this, at this point, are you looking to native traditions of clothing in your design? It was uh, using, well, actually the no, the answer is no, um, it was it was uh, contemporary, everyday wear. Uh, something that I would actually wear, not something for a runway show, but functional clothing, but very, um, you know, something that would have kind of an original, I like the original uh, ideas of design. And um, so I was able to use some of the scraps of fabric and uh, to create some pieces. And uh, so that, that was just on the side. I mean, it wasn't mm -hmm. in a class or didn't have any, we didn't have a fashion design course uh, program there, but we did have the fabric design. Who were some of your classmates in terms of painting? Um, <clears throat> My classmates, um, I shared a studio with Earl Eater, Kevin Redstar, David Montana, uh, Linda Loma Hoftewa was there at that time, um, T.C. Cannon, uh, Parker Boydell, Sherman Chattelson, um, Doug Hyde was there, Corita Coffee, um, many of the artists that we know now, you know, that are recognized in the world of, of Indian art. Did you have sort of a, was it whoever got to the studio first and... No. How did that work? Uh, <clears throat> our curriculum was set up to uh, offer us art studio classes half a day and academic classes half a day. So we had an academic building where we had classrooms like any other uh, public school and then we had art studios and I guess my first year we were given the opportunity to experiment you know to take um, different classes for short periods of time to see what our interest was. And in our junior and senior years, I recall having my own studio area, which was kind of a cubicle in a studio, but uh, a cubicle that was uh, probably, I'm not sure what size, maybe eight by 10. And, uh, and we had, had walls, just half walls in between the sections. So we had a little privacy, but we, um, you know, we were given enough time. It wasn't like you had 50 minutes to work on your art and now you have another class. Mm -hmm. uh, we did have, we did have various art classes too that we uh, changed and went to, but 
as time went by, as we advanced, then we had more studio time. And uh, I would say that it was uh, when I went to college later and lived on my own and had 100% studio time, um, that was a good way to enter into that. So what um, medium were you using most frequently? Were you painting in acrylics mostly or oils? Or? I used, I remember acrylics being introduced when I was in high school. I mean, I was introduced to acrylics for the first time and, and uh, <clears throat> some of the um, oh, pop artists, pop art was becoming uh, popular and uh, uh, colors were exploding into very vibrant colors and so um, I worked in all different media and um, but I had started out with uh, uh, water-based paints and, and oil and then I remember trying acrylics and just wasn't the same as oil paint so I did a little bit of both and eventually mm -hmm. I got more into acrylic because of the uh, probably all the reasons anyone does. It dries fast and, and the colors are vibrant and um, I was uh, working in a probably the style of art that I eventually transitioned or evolved into was uh, more of a an abstract expressionist type of of what was called action painting at the time in the art okay. scene in California. Right. So, and you did go on to University of California at Santa Barbara. Yes, to study with um, Howard Warshaw. What what um, made you decide on that program? I had never considered uh, University of California and I had never heard of Santa Barbara, but uh, Scott Mamaday came to visit our school and he was an English professor there at uh, University of California at Santa Barbara and so he recruited me to come to school there. He, um, he recruited all students, but I was one who uh, applied and got a scholarship and at the time, um, the the school was pretty you know had a reputation of being a like a a school without diversity a school without racial diversity a school that had um, ninety percent students did not have financial aid and um, and they also had a, a pretty good sized uh, international program as well but um, the minority races of the United States were absent and so a scholarship w a program was developed and, and uh, so I went to school there on that scholarship so uh, my parents didn't have to pay money they did you know they sent me money but uh, and they probably paid for me to get there and back home but um, it was a totally, when I went from uh, rural Oak Fusky County to Santa Fe, I, it was like going to the moon, being in a totally different universe. And then going from boarding school in Santa Fe to Santa Barbara to the beach party scene. I mean, <laughs> it was a totally different universe again. I mean, going from a 100% Indian school to Santa Barbara to that uh, on a on a scholarship for minority students and there were just 12 of us so total or from the institute 12 no I was total. the only one from you the were institute. the only one from the institute um, there were 12 on our program on our scholarship mm -hmm. program and the others were African-American from mm -hmm. all across the United States and um, the next year the second year I was there I uh, asked my roommate from Santa Fe, who was from Washington, whose name was Phyllis Noyes, to join me at Santa Barbara. So she came down and came to school there. And um, then there were two, yeah. <laughs> two Indian people there. <laughs> um, 
I did meet a uh, boy who was part Apache, who was already there when I, he wasn't on this scholarship program. But um, we had the privilege of being uh, mentored, I guess, at least kind of looked after a little bit by Scott Mamaday while we were there. And she actually um, worked for him as a student worker and did a uh, did some clerical work on typing his manuscript for Way to Rainy Mountain. Um, I was working in the campus art gallery as my for my student job, and that uh, I had the experience of minoring in exhibition arts at Santa Fe, and so the job that I got in the university art gallery was really important because we we um, set up some really exclusive art shows from some of the best collections in 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 the United States and uh, so stemming from the work I did at the gallery there then my supervisor um, hired me in the summertime to well the whole crew of us to help set up exhibits at the Santa Barbara County Art Museum which was a a really well-known museum and uh, so we I got a real good experience there um, the art program the fine arts program was good the um, Howard Warshaw who was my main uh, advisor in art was a muralist so this gave me a, a greater different perspective on uh, on doing paintings and drawings, uh, he had a, a very good uh, style, I guess, of three dimensional drawing that was uh, very helpful, you know, in in what I learned about form. So, how did your style change? Do you think after you left Santa Barbara, or had it changed after I left? Uh, Santa Barbara, um, I did a lot of life drawing in college there. We hadn't, we hadn't done, you know, much of that at all at the high school. So I did a lot of life drawing and, and then, um, uh, really, uh, learning a little bit more about watercolor and about, um, uh, mural art. Then when I uh, came back to Oklahoma, I I think I had a freer a freer style than I had had um, when I started out when I was in high school. You know, just experimenting with with a lot of things. I uh, used a lot of um, mixed media. And uh, so when I came back to Oklahoma, I think that mixed media uh, technique kind of uh, entered in again, but I had a more, a little more sophisticated style, I think, more mature style uh, in, in art. And uh, inspired inspired by my surroundings and availability of resources, just like when I started out on the <laughs> at the farm. <laughs> I often found myself with not enough uh, money to buy art materials, uh, canvas or uh, stretchers, and so mixed media entered in again, and some of the best pieces, some of my favorite pieces are uh, um, pieced together with wood mixed with canvas to, to, to meet the dimension of a, of a stretcher bar that I had. So uh, I don't know, I guess, I guess over time uh, anyone's uh, style goes through various evolutions and, and mine did as well. 
I, I really think that um, probably from the beginning of my life, my creativity is most um, dynamic when I am limited in what I have to work with and, and make that work. So what um, led you back to Oklahoma? Did you think of it as a permanent move? Were you, what were you thinking? I came back um, when, I, when I was in Santa Barbara. My brother had just, um, about, the time I, about the time I left for Santa Barbara, my brother left for Vietnam. And uh, so just being away from home, after having been away from home already, for three years at Santa Fe and one year at Santa Barbara. That second year was particularly difficult for me. And I, um, I had also had um, a health issue come up with a injury from playing softball in the summertime. That bothered me a lot, so. Just everything, it just seemed like there were a lot of uh, personal stresses that, that second year that I went to Santa Barbara. And always, um, as I was having fun walking down the beach or <laughs> doing something in sunny California with the most beautiful flowers I've ever seen in my life, I I thought of home and I thought of, at the time I thought my parents were, were getting old very rapidly. I mean like, oh my gosh, my parents are so old and I won't have much time with them by the time I ever graduate from this university. <laughs> those, those types of things, you know, entered my mind, but as I, um, it, was, it was somewhat I wouldn't say difficult, but it was different living in a world where I wasn't surrounded by people of my ethnicity. And um, I didn't find any substitutes for that anywhere. And, and it was, you know, it, it made it more um, vivid in my mind, the importance of that community. and the knowledge that my parents might have just about me being a Muscogee Creek Indian person that I wanted to know. And I, you know, I, it wasn't that I didn't know because I think probably before I went to Santa Fe, I was well grounded in that. Uh, <clears throat> but I, when I, kind of weighed the difference between getting that education at the university in Santa Barbara versus getting the education that I could at that uh, community that I came from. Then the community became more, a little more uh, desirable, important to me. And uh, so I had, um, my father, you know, once he told me that he wanted me to come home, and uh, I was saying, well, just, you know, I'll finish out, let me finish out the whole year here. And, and he said, uh, you know, you need to come home. And so my mother, I guess he told my mother, and my mother enforced <laughs> <laughs> but I, we were on a quarter system at Santa Barbara. We weren't on semester system. So I didn't quite finish that second year at Santa Barbara. I came home and uh, stayed home for a while, a few months, and then I got another opportunity, and that was to get back into museum studies at Santa Fe. And so I went back to Santa Fe and and I did that at the Museum of New Mexico. And um, then what really brought me back home was actually that I got married. And married someone that I had met in Santa Fe years before, but um, 
now I'd been gone for a while and and uh, came back and then um, got married. He was from Oklahoma too, and so uh, he had already kind of decided that he was ready to move back to Eastern Oklahoma, and so I was. That was fine, fine with me. So, were you thinking when you moved back to Oklahoma, I'm going to try to be a full-time painter, or had you already decided you wanted to finish an art degree? I uh, knew that I needed to finish my degree, and um, that was my plan. But uh, when I came back, I probably was I can't remember when I actually started back. I went uh, part time for a while at OU. And no. Oh. I took uh, I took a few uh, summer courses at NSU. My sister was uh, working on a teaching certification, and so uh, she went to summer school each summer and so I took a few courses when she did and then um, eventually after taking a few courses at NSU and a few courses at East Central at Ada then I decided that I'm halfway finished and I need to just go full-time and that's when I started to OU. It was several years later I, I really uh, didn't go full-time right away and so um, when I did start to OU I stayed there and, and I took classes winter, summer, spring, I mean year-round until I was finished. Now were you also exhibiting at, during this time when you... Yes. Um, I did exhibit work and uh, this was something that was different too that I had tried exhibiting or I did exhibit at some shows in Oklahoma during that time and I didn't find the market the same as it was outside the state. Uh, it was it was very a very different expectation of our uh, native artists here at that time. And Can you explain just a little more? I would say that um, at the venues in Oklahoma that offered um, art exhibits, the uh, what was at the time I guess recognized as contemporary abstract art uh, was clashing a little bit with what was considered traditional native art. Uh, in style and some of the uh, museums and galleries had had uh, restrictions that they might only uh, prefer the two-dimensional style uh, what was called traditional painting and uh, so my work was was very different and one of the things though that I did, because my sister was very into that uh, that type of work and was very good at it, was recognized she had won a lot of awards uh, in that style and did beautiful work. And so um, I really did uh, at one point want, I had the desire to see what my work would look like in that style. And uh, so, you know, we, we had some shows that we were both in and um, I sold some work and won a few awards and have some work in some collections. Like at Philbrook um, or Five Tribes? Or I did Philbrook and the Five Tribes Museum several times. Uh, Pawnee Bill Museum, and uh, it seems like there were some others. I've had, uh, well, just 
Oklahoma City, there were, you know, several places in Oklahoma City that that we showed our work. And uh, so I kind of, you know, I I did that for a little while and really I, I wanted to see, you want to see what what comes of it, mm-hmm. what, what your work looks, what my work, I wanted to see what my work looked like in that style. And um, I had, I got some pleasure out of, out of doing that type of work. I didn't, uh, it, it was probably very limited to uh, depictions of things that I knew from my childhood or from my community. And um, one thing in particular, a couple of things I can remember in particular were paintings that I did in that style one at our cemetery. We had an elderly man who was uh, he was so so um, so much of a a uh, common presence at our churches and at funerals. He was always there, and and uh, so I did a painting of him. Uh, at our cemetery and it was just from my memory mm-hmm. of him and then um, another time when my mother and a couple of her cousins distant cousins were very good friends and they had been in beadwork classes together my mother used to teach beadwork classes and and uh, so these two women from Willika were elderly women and they loved going to be at work classes and and one of them was killed in a car accident. They were together I think. They had gone to buy some beads at a store <clears throat> in Shakota and, and were in a car accident and and so one of them was killed in the car wreck and and uh, at that moment I mean her her face was so uh, ingrained in my mind and I did a, a painting of her doing beadwork. So those were the things that I had seen my sister do also. Things that were just part of our everyday life and um, nothing pretentious or nothing beyond what we knew, you know, as far as our, our traditions. Uh, so anyway, uh, <clears throat> those two paintings really had some deep meaning for me mm-hmm. of uh, uh, kind of personal personal meaning. How did you end up sort of going towards the idea of getting a master's degree in in um, education I guess well not well that, that's that's a pretty good story I guess. <laughs> I got the degree in fine arts at OU, and it wasn't something that I, just the honest fact of, of that degree was that I had had a, an, a very good uh, education at Santa Fe at the Art Institute in Art, and also at Santa Barbara, and, and I didn't find uh, it to be equal at the same, you know, I didn't find it at the same level, but I got that degree. That was the important thing, to get right. the degree. And um, so then I just did artwork for about 10 years, and I, as I was graduating from OU, I got into the fashion designing business by accident. And uh, it was, again, well, I think, you know, I will design a few pieces for myself and just to see what my work looks like. <laughs> and so uh, I designed a few pieces which led to more and which led to people seeing them and people wanting to put me in this or that show or uh, you know getting me a custom order from someone or you know I found a, a good market. In, in doing that and so for the 10 years between graduation at OU 
and starting on a master's degree at NSU. Um, I lived in Adair County and by, you know, and 10 years later I had three little girls and um, I had a studio there with my sisters, the Five Collection Studio, and that was uh, where some of the original designs originated. Um, it was right beside my house. And um, so as time went by and we were into that business, I did, I had to, you know, go back and forth to Henrietta a lot or to Tulsa and, and we traveled out of state and um, our business was kept us pretty busy and we all had our young children at that time my sisters and I and, and um, so uh, my husband was a school administrator and we I decided I mean he was you know, at his job a lot, it was pretty demanding, and and uh, so I spent days on end talking to you know my children, <laughs> young young children, and so one day in my studio I decided well, and they were they were totally involved from birth. I mean, their little swings, you know, in the studio, <laughs> but. I decided one day that I wanted to, uh, I really had the desire to have some intellectual conversations with with someone in the, kind of an academic world. And so um, I announced that I was taking some of the grocery money and going over to NSU, which was 30 miles away, to enroll in a class or two and see if I wanted to find a master's degree program there. And actually at the time, there weren't a lot of choices as far as master's degrees offerings at NSU. And so the one that I could fit into that I you know, wouldn't have to backtrack too much was in education. And it was curriculum and instruction. And I had done a little bit of teaching at NSU by then. I had taught uh, in the continuing ed program, some traditional techniques, uh, classes to teach about uh, <clears throat> fabric, fabric arts, and uh, combining native designs uh, on fabric. And uh, I had also done some teaching, adjunct teaching in the art department, um, just a class at a time. And uh, so I went to, uh, I had also used their studio. They had set up a new etching studio with a new etching press. And I had done a series of, of prints in that studio. So I was a little familiar over there. And so I enrolled in a graduate uh, program and I went through it pretty quickly because I, was a full-time mother and, and professional artist and designer. <laughs> so um, I got the master's degree and I also uh, went beyond the master's degree into school administration because at the time if you wanted to be a school administrator you had to earn the master's degree, take 16 hours above the master's degree and and take a competency test for uh, certification. And I didn't know that I wanted to do that, but I I took the courses and I, I never went beyond getting the uh, the coursework. The credential, I have the credentials, but I didn't ever act upon that mm -hmm. for, I didn't really want to work in public school at all. Mm -hmm. And um, so as I was, graduating as I was earning my degree uh, and ready to go back to the studio and now I've had a couple of years doing what I wanted to do. <laughs> uh, I was offered a position directing a graduate uh, teacher training program for in bilingual education and so I accepted that uh, offer at NSU 
and I, I did that for nine years. Mm -hmm. It was an administrative type position as director of a program and um, that led to me working for uh, five or six years in the College of Ed, uh, working with teachers, undergraduate teachers. And uh, meanwhile, I got the doctorate degree. Both are in curriculum and instruction. And I, I really found value in my design background in the educational discipline or field of curriculum, designing curriculum and designing educational programs and designing instruction. In what so, way? The same way that I would uh, paint, do a painting or design anything. Uh, you have your design elements. You have color line, you know, balance, depth, mm -hmm. all, all of those things that you really, you have probably different terminology for them, but the same design elements go into designing a good, solid program for whatever purpose it is in education. And uh, I would say even the color and vibrancy have to be there, and especially today. Uh, with uh, There are a lot of nuances, you know, that, that uh, have to fall into place. That's really interesting. Well, just to pick up on your design firm just a little bit. Um, <coughs> what was unique, do you think, about, or what is unique about Five uh, Fashions Limited? The Five Fashions? At the time, the uniqueness was the, probably our, um, research that we did and discovery of southeastern motifs that we really did not see in uh, any uh, any form of contemporary art at the time. Were, were you seeing a little bit in pottery yet or not really? No. Or jewelry? Okay. Um, Anna Mitchell probably mm -hmm. was getting started about the time we were. Um, some of the people who use that, I, did, I didn't see it in the pottery that I had seen. Mm -hmm. I was in the Southwest. I also uh, um, was in the midst of a lot of people who did contemporary abstract style designs in, in pottery. But I had not seen any in, in uh, South, any Southeastern or Mississippian period. Mm -hmm designs in pottery at that time, or jewelry. Uh, Nagofti Scott came mm -hmm. along, uh, kind of, he was developing probably about the same time, too. Bill Glass, and, uh, but as far as in uh, what we used in the Fife collection, we knew that uh, we used Seminole patchwork, and we didn't try to create a new design of Seminole Patchwork. We tried to use the authentic original patterns that were created by Seminoles. We knew, and we knew then, we knew now, know now, um, these are, are some traditional patterns, original patterns of, of Seminole that have, um, uh, are defined in a specific way by the Seminole people and Miccosukees. But we know also that our tribe in Oklahoma has adopted Seminole patchwork in, in traditional wear. And uh, so that was, I guess, one of the, one of the uh, attractions that it, ha it was something that was adopted and has become a part of our culture as well, but still giving credit to uh, the original designers and the original, I would say, engineers. If you've ever tried to do make seminal patchwork, 
I would give credit to the Seminoles for the engineering right. of Seminole patchwork. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, that that's something that we adapted. It's a beautiful, uh, beautiful set of patterns that have meaning for our clans or for their clans, but some for ours as well. And um, so we used uh, the Seminole patchwork designs and we used um, the Mississippian motifs which we can't really claim uh, you know unless they're from the, the area where our people originated in the Mulgee Mounds uh, Basin area. Uh, we, we can't really claim anything as exclusively Creek. As a matter of fact we are a confederation so we are a diverse group within ourselves and and so I would say that you know what we used in the five collection um, was something that that we have some attachment to something that has meaning to us and we really uh, didn't try to exploit any uh, traditional designs of other tribes except for the tribes that were in our family with eight siblings in the family and um, just a large, we have a large family, all boarding school people who have intermarried with different tribes. And so uh, one of the things that we did in our research was to uh, become familiar with the design motifs and styles for our children, the children in our, in our family. Uh, and for them to know, you know, be be able to uh, to know the difference that something isn't just generically Indian, unless it's a something like I would say what would be generic to all Indians, something like maybe a, a blanket or a shawl. Mm -hmm but still with a tribal yeah. motif on it. I understand you had the tags on the outside of your fashions. Who came up with that idea? We did that on some of our things just because we liked our tags. Um, we made a lot of sketches uh, because we belong to the Watko clan, Watkulki, um, and that's the raccoon clan. And um, so we looked at the, you know, we looked at at uh, reproductions of designs from the mound period to see if we, you know, what we could learn about raccoons being depicted in designs. And so there were several, and um, so we each made sketches and uh, looked at them, and then Sandy is the one who refined our logo and um, so we had some woven woven uh, uh, labels made and of course to order them we had to order a thousand or something <laughs> <laughs> and, and I have three labels left three I mean we don't have thousands of labels left I mean hundreds we used them all to hold on to those <laughs> and um, so they were we liked the labels so the labels weren't on the outside of all of our clothing, but sometimes we would put them in a side seam where they were folded and one side would say the Fife Collection and the other was our raccoon logo. But one of the things that uh, I guess I started was to sign my designs in stitching uh, on a skirt or a shirt, wherever it might be. And uh, that was to distinguish mine from Carol's or Sandy's. Uh, Sharon's or Robin's or our mother and um, so not everyone did that um, so some of our things have signatures and some don't but most of mine do and in terms of responsibilities or could did 
any of you sisters like you could you would have an idea for a design or did you do most of the designing or how did that work out okay here, <laughs> here, here here's how that worked out here's how that worked out um, as I told you before when I was my last semester of college at OU I had started designing a few pieces and um, so people were wanting to show my show my work and why don't you design this and that and then my sisters they really got excited about it <laughs> and they were saying okay and next why don't you you should make this you know and they had wonderful ideas and so then I said why don't you do it we could all do everything equally so it was if you have that idea you design it you know you know how you want it to look and it's your idea and so that's how the five collection came about that just it's like ideas grow you start out with something and then get ideas for more and more things and um, that's really how how the five collection grew it was it was no you design it and so I never liked sewing. I don't like sewing. My mother loved sewing. And I especially do not like to do anything by hand. <laughs> but I will, you know, I would make a prototype because once I had it in my mind what it what I thought it might look like and I start to put it together, I can't wait to see what it looks like finished. And so sometimes when we did have our business, once we, once we opened our business and became incorporated, um, then at that point, sometimes I could just come up with the idea and uh, make a prototype and then someone else can, could replicate it and I didn't have to. And so uh, we never did. We never did go into the mass production business. Mm -hmm. Although you know, I guess we were probably like influences were headed that way, and uh, we we were a band of artists. I guess band of design. We were a band of designers, <laughs> and we uh, really hadn't had business experience. So we made a business plan. Starting out, made a business plan. We had a portfolio, and um, once we did that, it was like when you write your first resume and say, "Oh, okay, this looks pretty good." and I can build on this. Uh, we made a business plan and when we decided to uh, incorporate as the Five Collection, we did everything in, a, in an appropriate business fashion and we, um, you know, stayed pretty well organized and we were like any other small business, especially one that doesn't have one to model after. And so um, we pretty much um, invented this business as we went along and expanded it and, and put um, revenue back into the business. And um, we had the business as a business for eight or nine years, probably close to 10. Uh, but we just operated it like like a business, but we also operated it as artists knowing that we could change our mind tomorrow and not want to do that. And so every day of our business, if we wanted to, we could lock that door and walk away and not owe anybody anything. And that's probably that's not smart for, amazing. you know, business-wise, but that, uh, that was how we did it. Mm -hmm. You needed that, that space. Well, let's talk a little bit more about your processes and, and techniques as an artist. Um, you've mentioned your media. Um, 
But some of the paintings that I've seen of yours have kind of sort of a social or political commentary. <laughs> um, can you explain why that's important to you? I can. Um, I think that probably in my adolescence was a very uh, a time of a lot of um, move toward justice for minority people. And so there was a lot of uh, political undercurrent going on. And we know today that um, artists have a lot of, uh, artists have had a lot of influence over time in, in telling this story or uh, depicting some of the inner workings of what's going on. Uh, maybe just uh, drawing on the emotions of the viewer. But um, during the 60s and 70s, I guess right before I went to uh, Santa Fe to school, I learned about, became aware of Martin Luther King. And uh, we didn't have a television, but we had the, uh, some of the major magazines that were informative and, and the Tulsa World newspaper. There were a lot of civil rights activities going on that were uh, alarming, uh, enlightening, and I really did. Um, I really did like, admired uh, the nonviolent movement of Martin Luther King, and so. Uh, that was somebody that had a early influence on my philosophical thinking, I guess. And um, as a when I first went to school at Santa Fe, uh, John F. Kennedy was was assassinated, and that was some major national event that happened, and I wasn't home. <laughs> I was away from home, <laughs> yeah. and and but the. Uh, I, I remember being in the dining room mm -hmm. at my school and the postgraduate students were a lot older than I was. I was had just turned 15 and and I remember there that they were so serious and and so emotional mm -hmm. about it and and our dining in our dining room at our school was family style dining and they mixed the postgraduates with the undergraduates and uh, so that that also you know was something that that struck me as uh, being here I am out in the in the larger world outside my community and this is happening and uh, so over time uh, probably when I was at OU the American Indian Movement was occupying uh, wounded knee and some of the early incidents of, of the AIM movement had already taken place. And I remember uh, just how these things affect, I always felt protected at home in my home community. But I, uh, you know, knew that as I heard about uh, people who were becoming involved in the AIM movement, or about meetings being held nearby. Um, then these outer world national things were affecting my home community that I thought was always safe and protected from any anything. Um, it always seemed calm there. And so there was maybe a little agitation going on. And, and I felt protective of our elder people there that that might not fully understand. Uh, like I said, we didn't have a television, so mm -hmm. I didn't know. Uh, you know, some I, some of the people that I knew, I I didn't know how 
fully they were perceiving what was happening. Things were happening pretty quickly. And uh, some of the things, I did a, uh, I did an etching, a large etching, and I really got the image off of a photograph that was on the front page of the, probably the Norman transcript. I think I might have been at, hmm. at OU at the time. And D. Brown's book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, was kind of new at that time. And I made the title of my etching because it was an Indian man holding two rifles. He was down on his knees or something, holding two rifles. And they had the inverted American flag. And there was, you know, violence happening there. And, and I titled that, Oh, Bury Me Not at Wounded Knee. Just something that I hated for people to have to go through. I mean, anywhere, any, any of our people. And uh, one of the recent uh, commemorations that my sister had the opportunity to go to was the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. Uh, commemoration and she sent back the the photograph of the luminaries that were placed uh, one representing each uh, creek that was killed in that battle in an open field at night something like that is very touching also that happened to our people closer to me than, uh, than that other movement. But those are the things that, uh, that is the way that political statements get into my artwork. Does um, sketching play a big role in your paintings? Uh, not necessarily. I have a, I did a series of, uh, of large canvases, really large, like I just stapled them to the wall, <laughs> painted <laughs> on them, and then I made a stretcher for them. Um, one of them in particular that I remember that was uh, published in the, I can't remember the name of the publication now, but it was by, it was a publication of the Southern Poverty Law Center, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember how it was selected to be in there. It's been a while back. There was a, uh, the painting was called Canvas, Canvas Ghosts, and it was images that uh, this is how some of my paintings evolve from a blank canvas then as I began to you know just apply well maybe sometimes not applying anything to the canvas but images it's like uh, images come forth and I began <laughs> working on that, working on those images, mm -hmm. and and then they evolve. It's not like I sketch out a painting and then I paint it mm -hmm. ever. Mm -hmm. uh, or but, even that you go in necessarily with an idea. Right. It's like uh, um, in not instinct, I guess instincts, but. Um, Oh, there's a, a word that is that I can't think of right now, but uh, not anything really deliberate. Mm -hmm. 
that intuitive. something yes intuitive that happens and and then I just build on that till I there's a stopping place and, and that's that's how many of my paintings uh, evolve and and I remember that painting that I called canvas ghosts because that especially was one that uh, I liked that painting and that's how it evolved as well is it um, do you find titles come easily or are they challenging sometimes I guess they I guess my titles come pretty easily because probably by the time I get into doing the painting the title comes as well uh, there might have been a couple of times when I really you know was unsure but uh, I don't think I've ever had anything untitled. <laughs> <laughs> what art project would you most like to tackle if you had the time? I there I would still like to I would still like to do uh, some more etchings. I really, I see so many commercially produced, you know, commercial reproductions of artists' work. And I, I still really like the hand-drawn uh, original pieces. Um, I would, I would like to do an, a series of etchings. And I would like to try some, uh, techniques that I haven't ever done before. Uh, one of the things that I, one of the things that I really like, I don't like all um, artwork that is um, associated with computer generated images or photographs stuck to a canvas, but I love the work of Bobby Martin mm. and, and Bobby, you know, is um, Creek. He has done uh, some pieces using photo images either that are reproduced in painting or now reproduced in print methods that are really um, I think really project a lot of uh, depth and um, just really sincere depictions of our creek culture and um, so that's one of the things uh, he has invited me to come out to his studio and uh, you know he said I'll provide the art you know, I'll provide the supplies <laughs> just come out and and do something and so that that's something that I kind of look forward to and that would be new something new for me but um, a couple of years ago, we did the first um, exhibit, uh, museum exhibit of the Fife collection. I mean, the whole Fife, like all of the Fife family and some of our cousins. Right. <laughs> um, it was the first time. And um, as we began developing that exhibit, it, it became more and more, uh, you know, there were more ideas generated. It was like creating the piece of art as we were putting it uh, in place in the exhibit in the museum. And um, it could have been broken down into several different exhibits. But that was the first comprehensive collection of, from our whole family, including our parents. I saw it. I loved it. <laughs> it had the the handmade wooden loom, bead loom. Our father made us all one, all the girls. And so we had one of those. And he made my mother's wedding ring. And uh, so it, it really had the whole family. Uh, I would like to do something similar to that again and maybe make it um, I don't know. I won't even say. Uh, I wouldn't even say what I would think. I would want the outcome to be because it would probably. <laughs> <laughs> it 
it would evolve. Be a multi-year yeah. project. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, looking back over your career so far, what was a fork in the road where you, for you, where you could have gone in one direction, but you chose to go in a different direction? Fork in the road was uh, when I went into education, got a job that paid a regular salary that I could depend on getting every, you know, on a regular schedule and had health insurance and benefits and vacation, paid vacation. Uh, that's fork in the road from professional artist, uncertainty, uh, depends on your stamina and drive to keep going and erratic paychecks and um, it's something that I don't regret but something that I see another fork approaching you know opportunity for fork in the road again get back into artwork right. <laughs> so, so that that is is my dream and we often my sisters and brothers and I uh, often have talked about when we um, we all have had families and and uh, responsibilities and jobs that at some point we hope will change into an opportunity to do some things together again and with my brothers I just uh, have hopes of, of uh, having them take me places. Um, one of the things that we have talked about doing is taking a little tour of all of our land, our allotment land, various parcels of allotment land, to take a tour. And they go, they ride horses. Some of our land is inaccessible. But I want to be able to see all of that and then uh, some of our family have been down to our old homelands in Alabama and I want to do that as well. And um, my sisters and I have, uh, you know, there are some things that we would like to, we have ideas that just needs that stopping place to, oh, let's see what those ideas look like <laughs> in reality again. And uh, so we've, we've talked about, about uh, doing some projects together. And uh, now some of our offspring are into art. And my, uh, one of the things I would love most is to do some projects with my daughters, all three of them are very, uh, very uh, good artists, and, and all different, Hi. and um, um, I'd like to do things with them, and, and with my nieces and nephews as well. Um, those are, those are just a few of my <laughs> <laughs> dreams for my future. Lots of things to look forward to that we'll look forward to too. Um, is there anything else we need to talk about or you'd like to add before we look at your artwork? I probably would think of something after we stop talking that I, uh, that's important to me. Well, you were but, uh, inducted, I'll, I'll just mention this, into the Muskogee Hall of Fame in 2013. That was, that was a shock. It was a surprise. And it was very much of an honor for me because uh, something um, you, I have, I can, I can, uh, I feel very insignificant when I think about our, you know, our tribe to me is, is a pretty large community and uh, insignificance is good. Insignificance is very good and uh, I, I like uh, being one of the people and so this is something that had not been 
uh, something I aspired to, but when it was brought forth and uh, became a reality for me, then it was a very great honor, a very great honor. Well, we're going to take a pause and look at some paintings and artwork. All right. Would you like to talk about this painting just a little bit? Uh, I did this painting in 1982. Wow. I've had it for a while, and it's one of those paintings that I um, just started out with some paint on canvas, and then it um, developed into having some images, um, and I titled it Rain in the Clouds Below Me, and that kind of was inspired by um, when you drive from Santa Fe down to Albuquerque, you can be above the clouds and see it raining down, down below, and I don't know what about the painting um, led me to that, but but that's its title. I just I guess mountains, mountains and clouds in the background, but just images in the sky also. And this is an example of one of your more mixed media pieces, I guess. Yes, and this one is um, one that I did just uh, probably a couple of years ago, and uh, kind of again. It's kind of inspired by Bobby Martin's work with photography, but I used a, a natural, um, a natural paper, to develop Beautiful. the image of my grandmother Louisa Fife, and um, this is one of my favorite pictures of her because this is the way that she looked in her everyday style of dress, and this is the image that I have in mind when we think about traditional Creek women uh, dressing. And um, growing up, I used to see, and we used to do this too, actually, when I was little, carry our coins tied in the corner of a handkerchief. And so that is what I related to my grandmother's time, I guess. Uh, she actually died when I was two years old. So I think I remember her, but I might remember her from people talking about her and seeing some of her items of clothing, uh, some of her possessions in my early life. But um, that's something that I just constructed uh, with the handkerchief and the, her photo image. How about this piece? I was asked to do an illustration for the story about the origin of clans of the Muscogee people. And um, so I guess it was a really early morning uh, start on, the, on this painting for the illustration. And um, just using some uh, knowledge about Muscogean motifs and then uh, images of animals that are part of our clan system. But this um, illustration is in the permanent exhibit about Muscogee Creeks in the Broken Arrow Historical Society. The blues and browns are just really effective on you too. And this is a different medium here we're looking at. This is a, a drawing, I guess, with uh, uh, graphite and a little bit of watercolor in the background, probably mm -hmm. something stuck on, uh, I think there's some paper image attached to the surface as well, and that was something that uh, is not unusual in my work, but it's called Dream Painters, and when I did this, I, it, was, it was kind of like uh, thinking back on the studio that I shared with uh, some other painters at Santa Fe when we were very young and just starting out. And so I had, uh, I don't know, I'm not going to name names, <laughs> but some of the 
some of the people I shared studio with. All right. Well, thank you very much for your time today, Phyllis.